lecture. Interesting topic um, for this afternoon's debate. For all of you who were here yesterday, welcome back. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Um, I am Mira Sibisodi. I host a health and living show on a radio station in Malaysia called BFM 89.9. And um, I have had the honor of moderating the three debates at the World Cancer Congress. Yesterday was one, today the second, and tomorrow being the third. So, the topic for today, um, very heavy, you know, it's going to be tough moderating this one. Very close to the hearts of a lot of Malaysians, healthcare professionals. It's titled, Should Doctors Support Their Patient's Choice to Take Alternative Medicines? We know about 90% of Malaysians do resort to complementary and alternative medicines here in this country. We do know that half the world's population in developed countries do resort to complementary and alternative medicines. So I think the larger conversation for us to have is to talk about patients' choice. Why is such a large population resorting to complementary and alternative medicines? What is going on? Are healthcare professionals speaking the wrong language? And if you are, what is it that you should be saying that, you know, that everyone's going away from you? So, debating today, two very strong presenters, um, both of whom I've had on the radio show, coincidentally. But before that, can I ask you to open up your app, the World Cancer Congress app? If you open it up, there is an icon that says live polling. And if you go into live polling, can I ask you to tap on whether you agree or disagree? Are you allowed to campaign before the voting? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just thought we'd try. Well, to be fair to you, at the end of this session, you will vote again, and then we'll see how you, whether or not you had an effect on um, the decision making. Do we get a making. prize then? No, uh, that depends. Can you? Live polling, on to debate two, and then do you agree or disagree? Short while more, settling down. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. You win. I concede. <laughs> Not yet. So is that debate over? <laughs> Not yet. No. Oh, no. <laughs> We're settling at what? 50. F no, not yet. Wow. Hey, come on, guys. 56.45, Charles, can we settle at one number, please? 50. I think two of the words came from my wife. She's still clicking, I think. <laughs> are there phantom voters here, Mira? There are. Are there phantom voters? This Don't is talk about our country affair, like actually. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. 56.44. Oh, rats. Okay, so let me introduce our debaters for this afternoon, um, debating for this motion that we should be able to have this conversation on alternative medicines with our doctors uh, uh, is Dr. Vijendra Subramaniam. He's a consultant gynae oncologist. He's expanded his practice to include alternative and complementary modalities in the treatment of cancer at Makota Medical Center. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Vijay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mira. A very warm welcome. We're not ready yet. We're not ready yeah. yet? Ah, oh, gosh. Debating against <laughs> is Dr. Edmund. I thought you were just me against me. <laughs> the woman is always in control, doctor. Deba <laughs> debating against <laughs> Dr. Edmund Hamza, Chief Executive Officer of Hospice Malaysia, Malaysia's largest community palliative care center. And just to go through our format, each debater will be given 10 minutes each to present, their, uh, to present their arguments, after which we'll open up the floor for 20 minutes so you can ask your questions or even comment on it. 
after which we'll come back and the debaters will have five, minute e five minutes each to conclude their arguments. And that's the end of our debate after 60 minutes. We'll, po we'll do that polling again at the end of the session. So over to you, Dr. Vijay. Thank you, Mira, again. And let's uh, thank you for pointing out who's the boss here. A very warm welcome to all the cancer warriors from all over the world. It's nice to see you all here. I hope you're having a good time. Dr. Hamza, my esteemed opponent, do have mercy for this alternative soul. Now, this debate topic is very timely, and I'm grateful to the organizers to offer this space, I think, to open up the conversation. I think it's a very important one. As Mira has pointed out, I have been in conventional uh, oncology for a good 20 over years, and uh, I have the benefit of seeing things from probably both uh, perspectives now. Now let's face the facts, okay, and why this conversation is actually necessary. 18 million cancers, 10 million deaths this year, and more promised for next year. And for brain, lung, pancreatic, hepatic, and many advanced cancers of almost any type, the outlook is even more grim. Do these statistics actually instill confidence in our patients? Are you inspired by these horrendous statistics? I'm not. Patients are taking their lives into their own hands, seeking, searching. It is a survival battle. When patients seek alternative solutions, they are not seeking self-destruction. It is about self-preservation in a manner that aligns with their belief systems and knowledge. Do not underestimate or demonize them. While we celebrate the Glivac moments and the heroics of genetics, the geneticists, and the amazing people who work all over the world, let's spare thought for the more than 95% of cancers where there is no underlying genetic predisposition. I stand corrected. The world of epigenetics. Now, all our lives, we are told we must have a plan B. We teach our children, you must be prepared. Just in case, you must have an alternative plan. But oddly, in oncology, alternative is almost a four-letter word. Sorry, I mean... It's blasphemous. It's blasphemous to even speak alternative. Why is that? Now, I too had developed a healthy disrespect for anything branded alternative. I'm not sure how many of you in the audience, but I was happy with the, the, the word count there. Keep it up. Now, a phone call seven years ago was to change all that. A very close relative, she had diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. It's a large ulcerative growth on the left side, and she had severe lymphedema. And I offered to bring her to the best oncologist. Um, an unequivocal no. It was no to surgery, no to chemotherapy, no to... I said, okay, well, what, what do I do? What, what do you want me to do? She said, I will do anything else. She wanted alternatives. She was 73 years old. I had nothing to offer her. Now, back then, it was not a debate topic. It was a real-life situation. Now, can I forsake her, walk away from an hour of need? I think this is a situation many of you may find yourself, either yourself personally or your close ones. After some extensive research and with the help of some wonderful colleagues who have been practicing alternative medicine for much longer, my auntie agreed to a holistic line of treatment. I mean, this encompasses many modalities, mind-body medicine, nutritional optimization, oxidative therapies, detoxification, exercise, and some specific anti-cancer uh, natural-based therapies, many of which at that time I was quite clueless. Well, I trusted that these practitioners knew what they were doing. From a seven centimeter ulcerated growth, there was a steady resolution till she was left with a two centimeter superficial ulcer. She finally consented to a nipple-sparing white local excision. She was 75 by then and remains cancer-free to this day. Seven years and counting. I was euphoric at that clinical response, but I was also intrigued. How was this possible? 
as a man of science, and I think we all are in this audience, who are so driven by evidence-based medicine, I knew you can't just wish it away or explain it away as a miracle. There must be an explanation. So my interest was triggered, and I started digging deeper into the realm of healing. What I was about to uncover would change my understanding of cancer and how it was to positively influence my treatment approach. In January 2012, a desperate family brought their daughter diagnosed with stage 3C ovarian cancer. Having already seen several specialists, they couldn't bring themselves to subject their daughter to a hysterectomy and chemotherapy option, which was a standard approach. After much counseling, we performed a conservative surgery. We did uh, remove the main bulk from the right ovary, and we saved the uterus and the other ovary. And we did concurrent integrative treatment. In eight and a half weeks, from 33,000, her CA125 had normalized. Well, she is now married, and she has two children of her own, and she's cancer-free for the last six and a half years. I can almost hear the audience, some of you, maybe my opponent, shouting out anecdotes, anecdotes, and more anecdotes, because anecdotes. this is how we would, you know, rubbish anything that does not fit in with our line of thinking. Let me assure you that there are many, many, many more. We have just completed a review of about 40 patients, stage three and stage four, and recurrent ovarian cancer, some of the most difficult cancers to treat. This data will be published soon. Using an integrative approach and startling discoveries, almost half of them, we were able to induce remission without chemotherapy. If time permits, we will discuss this. Now, I've realized that by addressing the root causes of cancer, the body can play an active part in the healing process. Together with the impressive armamentarium of conventional oncology, we can revolutionize cancer treatment. It can be done, and now we don't have to find the funny gene that causes this problem. In opening up my mind and thinking out of the box, I learned many things. There are many useful strategies in alternative treatment. We cannot win the war on cancer with our hands tied behind our backs. At the point of diagnosis, patients are in an extremely vulnerable state. Some of you have been there, some of you deal with this on a daily basis. Con now, confusion, anger, denial, and a whole bunch of other confusing emotions. And then, bombarded with images of the destruction the impending treatments are about to unleash, now, this is a bit too much for anybody to handle. A doctor armed with balanced knowledge is in an ideal position to guide, inspire, motivate, and support this most gruesome journey. It is an overwhelming experience. Abandonment by the doctor because he or she does not believe, support alternative thoughts, in my opinion, is a dereliction of the sacred duty of the doctor. With rejection and abandonment comes extreme stress. A patient already struggling to make sense of the dreadful disease does not need additional stress, destroying her already weakened foundations. To my esteemed opponent, I would like to pose some questions. To the patients facing death and no possibility of cure using current conventional therapies, why would you deny them their right to choose therapies that may at least improve their well-being and probably avoid the financial ruin of expensive experimental drugs? Have you personally undertaken, maybe you have, a scholarly review of the various therapies? And if not, for those who are opposed to this, how did you arrive at the decision that alternative therapies have no proven value? That was my position seven years ago. Why did I reach that position? Because I had no knowledge of it. I just trusted what my, my superiors told me. Oh, no, no, don't go there. This is terrible stuff. Stay away from this. You know, this will do you no good. Now, the only reason my opinion changed is I took the trouble to actually reach out and understand what was this alternative therapies. And 
for the more than 10 million people that will die, have died this year and will die next year. Terrible deaths because we do not have a cure. Do you not have a compassion to allow them to pursue at least alternative therapies? If conventional treatment was effective and safe in all cancers, why would patients turn to alternative therapies? Why? Let's admit our treatments are not good enough for many situations, and really, we have to buck up. I think this is not good enough. 30 seconds. Now, to conclude. Now, a doctor, in the Latin word, to dosere means to teach. In English, it's a learned person. We can only teach and advise effectively and manage cancer if we are well-versed in both allopathic and the healing sciences. To support the title of this debate, I mean, is this even a debatable subject to support? We can't help our patients by turning them away. We need to understand and empathize. Them. We need to stand with them. So I do not advocate blind support, but support based on adequate knowledge. Learn it in the sciences of healing. Patients are wising up to the root causes of cancer and the potential for healing using alternative therapies. Unfortunately, they don't get good guidance. Doctors need to stop being the proverbial ostrich. I think we need to get out and start learning about some of these and find out which ones are applicable for some of your patients. Doctors can and should play an active part in helping patients choose the right alternatives and often, I would think, better alternatives. And finally, you know, for patients that often come to us, they have diligently done their research. They are working. They are working very hard, exploring all options. They come before the doctors. Doctors can't just dismiss and, oh, okay, no, I don't agree with that. I think that is not enough. That is careless. Now, relying on a standard scripted official lines of denial is not the way forward. Doctors cannot afford to be ignorant nor arrogant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. The proverbial ostrich. Hmm. Dr. Ednin, <laughs> debating against this topic of should doctors support their patients' choice to take alternative treatments, take it away, Dr. Ednin. Firstly, fake news. <laughs> you heard it here. This is fake news. This is a new day, and I've not seen today. And for every cancer patient, every day is something new that they never thought that maybe they would face. It's a blessing. Uh, let me get this. So I'm supposed to debate against unproven treatment. I'm a traveler. I have worked in medicine for a long time. I've traveled around the world in different countries. And I observe the lives of patients. I'm interested in their values and actions that demonstrate those values. I've done different aspects of medicine. I started in internal medicine, then family medicine, and now in palliative medicine. Um, and I'm an incredible coffee addict who's incredibly deprived because they only give you one coffee a day here. So I'm because not there's happy some song. literature that says it causes cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I want it orally. I don't want it the other way around that some others may want it. When I see a patient, they matter. They matter because they are there. They're not a disease. They're not a cancer. They are a person. And that's the start of, of where I deal with. So when I see a patient, I find out about the patient first. Who are you? I need to get to know you because I know about cancer, but I don't know the person. So I find out about the person first. I'm interested in the person. If you want to get patient outcome, the, the things that the patient wants, the three things that you need is that you need to understand the patient's values, you need to understand what's evidence, and what is your ability. With the best evidence and you don't have the ability, you're not going to get good outcomes. This is Aslin. Aslin is a young lady I knew many years ago. And the story is, I'm giving you a little bit of a story because she wanted her legacy to be told to others. Um, upon the birth of a second child, she found a breast lump. It was tiny, one centimeter, she found it. She went to the hospital and, and she was told it was cancer. She was persuaded to go for alternative treatment. She did that for a year. When she came back, 
it was already stage four. And then she had treatment after that. Her treatment was good. It, um, it, it responded, but the family kept pushing her towards alternative treatment. And a healthcare professional gave her four, four sets of pills to take. And um, again, the family persuaded her to abandon uh, conventional treatment. She continued to take herbs that's on her breast, and that got worse and worse. And within a couple of years, her, she's a different person, and she passed away in a home surrounded by her family. It's a long, this is a shortened version. that She gave me many tales, and one of the things was the regret that she, she did in listening to her mother's advice on taking alternative treatment. So from stage one, she went to stage one to stage four. When you see a patient, you only see the surface. You don't see what's in front and what's below the iceberg, which is a really stupid analogy because we don't have icebergs in this country. But underneath that, you have the physical and existential pain, and you have to explore those things. Patients have difficulty dealing with doctors. I'm, I mean, I agree, doctors are not very good communicators. They can be paternalistic, they can be ostriches and whatever else. But they need better training instead of just succumbing to, to supporting patients doing all sorts of things which might not help them. We love, pa pa patients have loved ones, but sometimes they squeeze the life out of them by saying, you can do this, you can't do this, you cannot eat this, you can't do that. And so patients do suffer. Love kills sometimes. <coughs> and negotiating the treatments in healthcare settings is hard. You can be alone, treatments, have bad side effects and imposing. And patients have to cope with so many things. The, the, it, the diagnosis and the, the, the experience of cancer is horrible. You wouldn't wish it on anyone, maybe except a few people. The whole idea is to ask why. Why is this happening? Patients ask that. Why me? Why is this happening to me? That person responded to chemo chemotherapy. Why am I not responding? It is not a linear uh, aspect. Um, it's a proportionate thing. Some patients respond, some patients don't. And you have this situation of finding hope in the time of crisis. What will happen? Will you survive? I don't know. You, are you for the frog or for the bird? I'll go for the frog. Treatment that sort may be all sorts of things, diets, herbs, animal-based, the number of animals that die in, you know, for cancer patients. There can be various pharmacological agents, spiritual, and many other things. What do you think of this when things may have got worse? Is, it, is this good news or bad news? Things are in the media all the time, miracle cures, all sorts of things. Vitamin B17, so many of my patients are on it. Sabah snake grass. Everyone, everyone knows this, except the oncologist. I'm not an oncologist, so that's the, but I'm the one, I'm the person the oncologist send the cancer patients after they've done with them. Look at this, this is the patient blog, and she went to, to a, a traditional healer in the north of, of, of the country, um, who's very well known. And just look at the treatment. Um, his treatment is to transfer the sickness to a chicken. We don't have to bring our own chicken, as the, they will sort out the chicken. But we have to pay for the chicken, and the price is depending on the weight of the chicken. Um, the virgin chicken is 18 ringgit, but the big cock costs 30 ringgit. <laughs> the chicken will be freed, and they will die within three days. That's all? That's for a chronic chick patient, the chicken was died already. <laughs> and it didn't matter. There were many patients, so you just divide the patients, you know, men and women, separately. And it's easy, the, the, the chicken will scan the area, and sort of take the cancer and the chicken will die. I mean, poor chicken, the amount of cancer the chicken will get. Um, and it's, it's not expensive, it's, it's just any donation. So this might be the, the issue of gullibility. And how do you deal with this kind of, of belief? And these are the things that you can't eat. And there's lots of things there. Those of you who understand Malay, great. The others, you, the Malaysians here can tell you, Lots of things you can't eat, chili, um, um, bananas, and lots of things. These are my patients. This is a patient where they were growing the herbs in, in the backyard and using them to put on the wound, and it became infectious. He used these rings to, to make him better. He felt that they were giving energy, and, and they were, 
I don't know, they probably didn't harm him, and great. Uh, they seem like atomic sort of particles in there. So maybe they're sort of surface radiotherapy. This was horrible. This is a patient with colorectal cancer, and those wounds in her back and neck were inflicted by a traditional healer. And the yellow things there are herbs that are put in there to absorb the cancer. And he promised she will, she will be healed because it keeps, he, she has to go every week to get these herbs changed. He promised he's cured other people in the past. And the husband says, you cannot die. This man was covered with ulcers because he went to a healer that used mercury in the bath. He had, his whole body was ulcerated. He became infectious and he died a few days later. There's many of it. These things are unproven. There's no evidence that it works. There's no evidence that it does either. What is the outcome required and the conditions that's achieve, that that's to achieve the outcome? But there is evidence of harm. Lenin. A lie told often enough becomes the truth. Keep repeating it and you believe it. There's lots of complementary therapies that gradually we accept that has some benefit in, in dealing with cancer care. And they have gone through rigorous testing. They don't promise to cure, but they will make you feel better in some way. And patient issues, cancer diagnosis, the effect of it. What do they think they know? The way doctors communicate, when they tell patients, you have failed, it's the cancer that didn't respond, the patients didn't fail. The options, are they explained properly in a language that the patient understand? How's the relationship between the doctor? What's the pressure from the family and others? And what is the outcome that is hoped for? There are many patients who says, it's okay, I've got cancer, I can deal with it. And the various therapies, what's the nature? What's promised? What's the outcome that's promised? And the conspiracy theories, the conspiracies of the drug companies ganging up and hiding the, the, the cures because they want to make all the money. You can believe what you want. What's the cost implications? It's not just conventional treatment that is expensive. Alternative treatment is also expensive. I was promised 1,000 ringgit for every patient I would refer for ozone treatment. What's the evidence? And there is evidence of harm. What's the evidence of benefit? But there are doctor issues. Doctors are not good communicators. There are conflict between medical goals and patient values. What is the duty of care and the ethical framework and your professionalization? Doctors that go into conventional treatment and then dabble with alternative treatment. How do you separate the two versus the BOMOS? And those are the therapists. What's the training, competency, standards, licensing, code of conduct, ethical, legal issues, and the um, purpose of treating? Is it a personal evangelical zeal that you want to do? Or is it because wherever there's a gap, you can make money out of it? Banks don't want to loan you, loan sharks will do it. Anywhere where there's a gap, someone will fill that gap. 30 seconds. Oh, God. I, GSD extra. Uh, Steve Jobs regretted having using alternative treatment, but placebo works. So, no, reasons for rejecting um, alternative treatment, resources, fear and distrust, lack of evidence. So, no, this, has, this is a study of patients who rejected, and these are the reasons why they rejected it. A couple of things, use of alternative medicine for cancer and in fact survival, wonderful paper. What it showed is that those patients who use alternative medicine has a higher risk of death. Great paper, look at it. Children, children sometimes have to go to, for treatment against their wishes by their parents. And this young girl wanted to sue her parents. <coughs> Malaysia tries to regulate this and tries to license it. I think it's a wonderful way to try and get some control over it. But in the UK, the biggest uh, hospital for homeopathy um, has been closed um, since early this year because the studies showed that, that there was no real evidence that it works. Viktor Frankl is a psychiatrist. Everything can be taken from man but one thing, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. The patients want control and autonomy. The issue about patient values versus doctor values. Patients do not know to ask for something they do not know about. 
they want hope. You need to look at things from both sides. And no, the answer is no. It doesn't deliver a standard outcome. It's a vehicle for false hope for vulnerable patients. It results in progressive disease and delay. Those who practice are not regulated. There's significant toxicity. It may interact with other treatment and cause significant harm. It affects the patient-doctor relationship and you die faster. It's not about the treatment. It's about the elephant in the room. And that's the conversation you need to have. Thank you, Dr. Ednan. Thank you. From the ostriches to the elephants. Um, yes. Dr. Vijay, you spoke about anecdotal evidence. Yes, as soon as you gave your examples, that's exactly what crossed most of our minds. But how do you measure the risk-benefit ratio when you integrate conventional and alternative medicine? And how do you know of people who came to see you and never came back um, because it didn't work? Okay, uh, th thanks. That's a very good question. I think this is important because I think all treatment should be objectively <clears throat> assessed, objectively evaluated. <clears throat> Um, when we approach a patient, uh, we look at this patient in a holistic way. Uh, and I think Dr. Hamza has, uh, has spoken about it. It's not, we're not treating a cancer. But we're not just focusing on what is the destructive potential that we can unleash, which is what a lot of conventional treatment is. I mean, bar for a little bit of you know, immunotherapy and some targeted therapies. But the bulk of our therapies is uh, very destructive in nature. Now, it is necessary at times to engage in such therapies, but it does not address the issue of why this patient often developed the cancer. So we need to get back to the root causes, and we need to understand that, like all diseases in human beings, there is a potential for healing. Healing is a, a default design in our body. We break our bones and it'll heal ourselves, you know, I mean, the bones will unite. Similarly, cancer cells can be detected and destroyed by immune system, which is why now we are moving strongly into immunotherapy as a, uh, uh, the next go-to destination. But the immunotherapy does not have to be exogenous. It doesn't have to come in a vial, you know. We, we can have a immune response that is uh, initiated in the body through a holistic way with the right nutrition and so forth. So we bring both on board. So we're not saying do alternative, you know, that we are abandoning you and we're not giving you uh, a conventional treatment, but we are seeing how best to bring the best of science, and there is good science in alternative therapy. Dr. Hamza has, you know, loosely dismissed everything with the same paintbrush because, you know, he has had a few patients who have you know, bad outcomes. Uh, but, you know, he forget, you know, forgets to mention 10 million people died this year, you know, and will die because that's a huge number. The treatment failed. And he did not make a mention of, you know, how ineffective our treatment is for those groups of patients. So coming back to those patients, we choose them, we decide based on a better understanding in a holistic fashion which types of treatment should be engaged. It is not a blunderbuss. Everybody goes through this, you know, oh no, your choices are protocol A, B, and C. You know, this is your choice. Choose A, you go here, choose B, you go. No, patients are not guinea pigs that should be sent through a, uh, 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 what do you call, it? conveyor belt and decide, okay, this is your options. No, we need to individualize in a far greater way. Okay, so consultative, very yeah. consultative. Opening up the floor for questions, anyone? Come on, fellow oncologists, I know you have deep questions. Yes. No, they have no questions. <laughs> Don't prod them. Come on. <laughs> Anyone? Brilliant. So this to uh, Dr. Subramaniam, sir. Uh, God forbid, I, I don't wish that you should get a, a no disease of cancer. Would you choose alternate first or would you take the allopathic medicine? Answer. Um, I wouldn't answer this in yes and no. I think every cancer needs to be looked at it in a more uh, focused and individualist way. For instance, I, I 
say, if I had a cervical cancer and if I had a stage one disease, yes, I would go for surgery, but I may opt not to go for maybe adjuvant radiotherapy or chemotherapy because I will then focus on helping the body heal through these various other modalities. Now, that is one option. Secondly, in advanced disease, we may use a combination of things. So, I mean, I, I mentioned briefly about, you know, the ovarian cancer data we had, uh, and I mean, Dr. maybe this will answer Dr. Hamza's question as well, that, you know, that there's no data. No, no, actually, we are generating data. It takes time, but we're generating data. And what we did with this group of patients, this advanced uh, stage three, stage four ovarian cancers, is we actually did a, uh, a systematic stepwise escalation in treatment. So patients who responded well to a healing-based therapies, you know, integrative fashion and surgery, and of which half of them did, they went into remission. So we did not need to use chemotherapy in these patients. So what we learned from that ex you know, experience is that there is a group of patients, actually, we can heal them. Now, of the other half, we actually gave them the options. They can go into conventional chemotherapy or a limited amount of chemotherapy in an integrative fashion. Most choose to do limited chemotherapy. Some did choose to do conventional chemotherapy. We found that at the end of the study, all those who had done conventional chemotherapy had died. The, the, the best outcomes were those who did not, choose chemo, did not need chemotherapy in the beginning. And the better outcome was with those with limited chemotherapy compared to conventional use of uh, standard chemotherapy. So my decision, if I, you know, God forbid, develop a cancer, so I would be looking at those things in making my decision, you know, and depends on which particular cancers that I, you know, I, I might be cursed with. Dr. Ednin. <laughs> what, if I had cancer, Which would, I would choose? you choose first? I would look at my options, but certainly I would be looking at something that, um, I, would, I would look at two things. I would look for a doctor that understands me. That would be the first thing, that would understand the choices that I make, the values that I hold. I would not want a, a doctor that's dogmatic and, and tells me what to do. Um, and I would look at a doctor that has the time to, to deal with the outcomes that I want and the options that he or she would offer that would deliver the outcomes. I'm sure that there's certainly several um, aspects of the disease depend of, the, of the treatment depending on the, the type of cancer I may have. Um, but I would want a compassionate, kind, intelligent, wise doctor who has time to listen to me and is able to deliver um, the treatment that would do that. So I would more likely be choosing somebody that has, that I feel I can trust him, more likely. You can trust me. Treatment. Okay. <laughs> nah. <laughs> um, Fake news. There. Yes, go ahead. Thank you for a fascinating debate. I'm Leonard Viron, Cancer Council, New South Wales. My question is really, well, should doctors uh, support their patient's choice to take alternative treatments is one thing. So you can accept that a patient wants to do a treatment and support them throughout anyway, hoping that they will not discontinue their uh, regular therapy. But the question for me is more, should doctors ever offer non-evidence-based therapies and charge their patients money for it? So benefiting personally from uh, basically offering people potentially false hope, is that, uh, so can we agree that doctors should never do that and mix the two? Dr. Ednin. I'm free. <laughs> I don't charge anyone. I don't believe in a private health service. I, I worked in the UK and in the NHS, and I believe it perhaps was one of the best health services in the world under pressure at the moment. And I then I felt that because I did not benefit financially from the patients, um, I had a salary, there was no compulsion for me, that, that there was no compulsion that I would take advantage of, of the patient's illness. Uh, so I certainly does not support the possibility that we could leech on patients. Dr. Vijay. Whatever that I've uh, experienced in the last seven years, uh, much of what I believed earlier that there was no evidence in alternative medicine, it was purely out of my ignorance. I, I'm not sure how many of you, I mean, honestly, in this audience, 
can raise the hand now and tell me you have looked at all of the alternative therapies and proved to yourself that, yes, this is all rubbish. Honestly, can I, can I have a show of hands? Dr. Viendra, you haven't shown us the evidence of a single therapy, alternative therapy, that was effective. <laughs> uh, I, I, I actually explained that we had, uh, I explained two cases, and then I said we are doing this review and that this, uh, this study is being published. Now, what is the evidence that you're actually seeking? I think we are sometimes too... Uh, do you charge or not? Up. I think the question was, do you charge or not for non-evidence-based um, uh, you know, therapy? Okay, of the half the patients that I said, you know, the cancer was in remission. Is that an evidence that cancer responded to the treatment? I, I would like to pose this question back to the audience. Is that evidence? Is evidence only accrued when we do in a randomized controlled trial? Is that the only level of evidence that we accept? So half, half the patients, no, no, I, I, think, I think those of you who, who rush to say yes, should need to think a little bit longer because a randomized controlled trial is very effective when you are using a single intervention, maybe a single drug, in a apparently controlled population. There's no such thing. I, I don't think a population can ever be controlled. But that is the premise, that we can use a single thing and therefore observe whether the effect of this or that does not you know, produce a result. But the fact is that, and I said, you know, when we do healing therapies, we are working with a complex biology, a body that has got a mind, body, and spirit that needs the nutrition. It needs a properly functioning organ system, detoxification, immune system, etc. They are multimodalities. Now, if somebody in the audience can stand up and explain to me how you would randomize and control that, and who would fund this study, I would be the first one to, you know, volunteer to be part of that study. Anyone? Yeah. Oh yes, I work in a private hospital. Somebody has to pay. Somebody has to pay the bills. It is in a private hospital. Yes. I, I wish. I wish I did not have to charge them because about 30% of the patients who we find we can't afford. Actually, we do not charge them. But unfortunately, there's nobody funding this. So if somebody out there who says, "Look, patients should not be charged." then I'm more than happy to provide this treatment free of charge. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. Can we have the next question, please? The debate is very hot now. <laughs> and I thank you. Thank you both yes. for your interventions. I'm Luzia Travado from Lisbon, Portugal. And I'm a, I'm a psycho-oncologist. But my question is, are we really posing the right question? Because I think it's a little bit tricky to say alternative treatments. We should instead say, complementary treatments. I don't think at this point we can say that alternative treatments can be given to patients with doctor support not to do the conventional treatments. What I have listened in both of them is that doctors should be with their hands in hands with their patients and hear their concerns and their values and preferences and if they wish, along with their conventional treatment, to do other complementary therapies that they feel may enhance their well-being, should they disclose this to their doctors or not? Yeah. And should their doctors support this or not? Yeah. That is a different question, yeah. because that's mostly the question that we see in the clinic is that, for instance, along with conventional treatment, patients would like to do acupuncture and other treatments that some of them have already proven to be efficient. But in a multidisciplinary world in which not one solution is the best to the patient's problems, maybe we should also share some of our um, uh, healing uh, process with some other options that the patient has. So I think this is a tricky question that we are addressing because both of you had indeed not said that you would rule out conventional treatment and I think we do not have the evidence to rule out conventional treatment. 
only when there is no benefit for the patient, we reached out the end when there is no benefit, and then it's open. But uh, complementary treatments, that's the question. Thank and you. Thank you very much. Alternative or complementary, Dr. Edmund? They're two different things, and, and all these, all the treatments that are out there, the complementary treatments are the one that we have shown to have some benefit. The benefit generally has been uh, decreased symptoms such as pain and nausea and, and fatigue and increased well-being. So we have no issues with those things because there is good evidence that it helps. And, and I dealt, I mean, for me in palliative care, we deal with the, with the, with the physical mind, body, soul aspects and looking at values and how people can actually live well with cancer. The ability to cure cancer is extremely limited, um, especially with advanced disease. But people can live well with cancer, with you know, minimal symptoms and, and really cope with it extremely well. The pursuit of a cure with advanced disease is going to be extremely difficult and for many patients could be painful and futile. And, and I think that with, the, with well, dealing with me is palliative care. Look, all my patients have got advanced disease. And the way I deal with my patients is actually be honest and be truthful with them and to support them. But I would not support them in taking alternative treatment um, because I will tell them this may not deliver what you think you might, you, you might achieve. But we promise that we will still inform each other. We don't abandon them. And if they choose to take this alternative treatment, we'll still keep in touch. But I will not say I will support you in this, but I will journey with you and we'll see what happens. Dr. Vijay, alternative or complementary? How, what would you call what you practice? I, I personally think this, some of this is semantics because uh, what was maybe previously considered alternative, I think 10, 15, 20 years ago, when people on this side talked about immunotherapy in cancer, the mainstream guys said, oh, what, immunotherapy? I mean, no, no, we are developing drugs that will kill. And while the guys on this side were working feverishly, boosting the immune system in many other ways and saying, you know, they're getting good results. Now we are saying, yes, you know, immunotherapy is part of mainstream. You see, it is about when we have realized and, you know, the knowledge base is sufficient for us to move things from alternative and then we'll say, this is mainstream now. So I think some of this is, is artificially segregated. We, we define these as mainstream, this is alternative. I think we should put the patient at the center of things, and we need to decide which one of these this patient needs in combination or you know, on its own. So let us not, I think, divide this as though there's a war between you know, complementary, alternative, and, and, and uh, uh, mainstream treatment. I think the, the, the goal or the challenge is to fight with the patient using all modalities that have a benefit. Thank you, Dr. How many of you yes. would keep chickens in your backyard to suck the cancer out of you? <laughs> I'm Dr. Abia from Nigeria. Um, my, que is, my question is a follow-up, so it's a response to one of the questions, the previous questions, where you talked about um, using the, doing surgery and then using the alternative treatment, and if Later on, if the person is not doing well, they may consider chemotherapy, um, full-blown or partial. And then he said that those that took uh, full-blown uh, chemotherapy, uh, most of them died. I just wanted to ask him, is it not because of the delay? Because you probably considered adding the chemotherapy later, late. Is it not why they, those people that you eventually up, uh, gave the chemotherapy died? Is it because, is it, are you suggesting that it's the chemotherapy that killed the people, or it's because... Okay, I, I got the delay. question. Yeah. I got the question. Thank you. All right. Actually, when we analyze the data, the average length of uh, uh, survival for that group that I said did full-dose chemotherapy was about 23 to 24 months. How Which, big is this group? This is stage Dr. 3. Okay. No, that was only about five patients. Uh, five patients who chose conventional full-dose chemotherapy. Now, so they did not die early. I'm just saying that, you know, when we did the analysis at the end of that uh, almost five years uh, follow-up, that group, patients had died. But they actually lived for almost the same 
duration of time as what we would can say historical controls for patients with stage three, stage four, or uh, recurrent ovarian cancer. But on the other hand, those patients that we did limited chemotherapy, they are, many of them are still alive. In fact, their survival rates are far higher than so what we had. Question is, are you saying yeah. chemotherapy kills? No, that's not what I said. No, that, that's not what it I'm does saying. Does it I or think does it not? It kills cells, yes. You know, I mean, if, that, if that's the you know, straight answer, yes, it kills cells. Uh, no, what I'm saying is that excessive and inappropriate use of chemotherapy is more harmful than using a limited chemotherapy in a selective way. Thank you. Dr. Ednin, chemotherapy. I think you need to choose horses for courses. And I, I, sometimes I have some issues with um, some of my uh, oncology colleagues um, providing very aggressive chemotherapy. I think he's sugarcoating his response. Come on, say it as it is, Hamza. <laughs> Come on. I'm in control, Dr. Victor. I, I, I think our cancer care has to improve, and I think many patients um, are getting sometimes inappropriate treatment as, and at the uh, advanced stages of life. And I think that our oncologists sometimes should uh, have better training into palliative care, so it has to be appropriate palliative treatment for patients that may not be in a curative setting. Lady over there. Ranjit Kaur, I had breast cancer 20 years ago. I was given, I, was, I had surgery, I had 12 cycles of chemotherapy. All my tests and scans showed my body was strong. I had social support, psychological support, spiritual support at that time. My body wasn't weak, I was strong. I didn't have any nutrition deficiency. I had 12 cycles of chemo. I'm alive 20 years later. My brains are still working and I'm in good condition. I lead many organizations and I'm fine. So chemotherapy did not kill me. Thank you. Thank you. Can I add something, Mira? It's not a question, but I think I wish that that is the testimony of every breast cancer patient. Can our oncology world say that is our gold standard? Because that is, that is really heartwarming to hear. That's what I would like to hear of every breast cancer patient, that it did not destroy them, it did not hurt them, they cured their cancer and they were intact. That should be the gold standard that we are, should, should be aspiring for. I'm gonna bypass, any oncologists want to respond to this? Any one of you. Didn't hear you there. Could you? Thank you. Survival rates for early breast cancer in most Western countries are over 90%. That's a pretty good record and better than anything else. And even getting better for metastatic disease. So we just need to be really careful what we're claiming. I think, I think that, that is also misleading because while we are, we, we, we suck We're running out of time. Just give me a second. <laughs> Gentlemen over there. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I am uh, Amos de Gracias Mwara from Uganda, a medical oncologist. I think I thank both, both debaters for talking quite very nicely about respecting patients' rights. The right to decide on what they want. I strongly believe and have always observed that patients go to where they feel they would get the best. Majority of the traditional healers do not call the patients to them. Patients go to them. When they go to the, to the traditional healers, should they be turned away? We have observed a number of patients who do die when they are on chemotherapy. We have seen many who go away from the hospitals. We think they are dead but several years, we see them alive, and they give us testimony of the so-called alternative treatments. But the question is, what is the alternative treatment? Alternative to what? This treatment is alternative to what? I think we needed to define what alternative treatments are. In 1887, when the British landed in Uganda, there were treatments. And so to some of us, 
chemotherapy is an alternative treatment. Is that what we are discussing? Interesting. <laughs> My traditional medicine, the traditional medicine that the people have been using in Uganda before the colonialists are probably the first choice. And I am not surprised that the literature shows that up to now, 70% of patients in East Africa and Uganda in particular go for alternative medicine, as you call it, but we call it traditional medicine. We don't even call it indigenous medicine. But why do patients go there? You know, we have had a number of patients, and one of them was a priest who was a professor. He asked, and he had what we oncologists, and he kept telling me whenever I called him that you refuse to give me your medicine. Why are you asking the medicine that I am using? We sent his documents to three different hospitals in India. We sent his documents, his CT scan, to one hospital in South Africa, and all these four hospitals said, we cannot do anything to your lung cancer. He used his traditional medicine, and two years after we had thought he was dead, he came back to the hospital for a different issue, and he was quite alive and strong. A professor in a university and a priest, a practicing one. He was no more coughing, he was no more dyspneic. Unfortunately, he refused to show me what that alternative medicine is. <laughs> but <laughs> let's call it the right name. Let's not call it alternative because to me, chemotherapy is an alternative medicine. Should I not use it? I do use it. <laughs> the first choice is the traditional medicine. Thank you. Thank you. The lady over here, just hold on a second. Yeah, um, hello. Okay, um, it is, I have a little anxiety standing here because a lot of naysayers are gonna not agree with what I'm gonna say, but I'm with Dr. Subramanian here um, because I'm a May cancer thriver myself. I don't call myself a cancer survivor because I'm thriving with cancer, I'm living with cancer. And you'd be surprised, I was a medical student myself, and I did not say no to chemotherapy or radiation or transplant or anything like that. So I'm going to share with you a bit of what I went through. <coughs> and disclaimer, I, I do not know Dr. Subramaniam. Don't think that he actually paid me to stand here to support him. <laughs> okay, um, I was diagnosed at a tender age of 21 happily studying in medical school, doing really well, Dean scholarship, you name it. And the next thing I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's B-cell lymphoma in my chest, bulky, bulky disease in my chest. And they did a scan, it found out it was enveloping my big vessels, my aorta, vena cava, everything. So it was inoperable. And of course, no one actually takes out lymph nodes. So um, I came home and they took biopsy. They weren't able to find out what was wrong with me. And in the end, pathologist told me that I actually have B-cell lymphoma. Okay. And as a medical student, you don't actually deny chemotherapy or anything. You just go with it with the no second thoughts. You're like, I'm in. So I went with chemotherapy, got my chemo port in, did six cycles. They said, prognosis is good. Stage 2B, you will, you'll be running again in six months. I'm like, okay. So I did, I went, and halfway through um, treatment, it showed response. I was doing well. He said, I have the most promising res um, drugs at that time. So I went to do that, and when I finished my six cycles, um, surprisingly, even during chemo, um, my cancer grew, so it got resistant to that. Fine, so put me on salvage treatment, so stronger chemotherapy, and um, they expect it to work because it's a whole <coughs> different regime of chemotherapy. Okay, went through that again. And um, unfortunately, it didn't work. Um, barely any response at all. And because the disease was so bulky in my chest, I developed um, multiple lung effusions. So I was in and out of hospital with my tube in, with my bag in, and I, w I couldn't breathe. The mass was pressing onto my trachea. It's only 0 0.8 centimeters. So I was on a BiPAP machine to breathe. Um, my left lung collapsed for once. It took the, the fluid out, and I was there for a month. And um, 
the doctor was so surprised. I was the first patient he ever seen to actually aspirate it as much as 40 liters of um, um, liquid from my lung, left lung itself. I so apologize. We're running out of time. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to it. Yeah. yeah. So long story short, I suffered lung effusions. I went to two septic shocks. I was on IV morphine. I was on antibiotics IV. I was on so many things. And end of the day, they weren't even treating the cancer because they told me there's nothing else out there. Chemotherapy wasn't an option. They gave me radiation, high dose, to a point that if I do any more, my lungs will be fried. So I get to know a um, alternative treatment doctor here in Malaysia, and she was nice enough to come and see me. And as fragile as I was at that time, she worked with me every day, and she used um, homeopathy coupled with a lot of, like you said, immunotherapy, um, because my white blood cell was zero. They gave me boosters. It didn't boost up anything. So I'm here today because of the choices that I made because complementary medicine, I mean, sorry, because um, conventional didn't work for me. So I am here today because I am a part of testimonial, because I'm here today. I'm able to run 5K, even though I have a bulky disease in my chest. I managed to keep it really, really stable. It's not spreading anywhere. And I am sure in my next PET scan will just show it's inactive. I'll just have a bulky disease left. And I was 35 kilos. On my bed, I mean deathbed, in 2016. So if I can show you pictures, that'd be great. But yeah, this is like one year. I'm doing good. Thank you. Uh, well done. Thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> so, my question goes to Dr. Um, Subramaniam. Uh, my name is Daniel from South Africa. I'm an oncologist. Um, there is. Um, a drug or a herb called marijuana or daha. And um, nowadays, a lot of my patients with metastatic cancer come to me. They want to leave conventional treatment and go and take marijuana or daha. Because I respect patients' rights, I allow them to go for uh, the drops of the marijuana. But my experience has been that when they come back to me, the cancer has already spread. What is your experience with the use of marijuana in the treatment of cancer? I'll Thank be you. in prison and I'll be hanged. Yeah. <laughs> but both, we are, both patient as a and country, doctor would have died in the process. But as a country, we are considering. Now, yes. Yeah. Uh, now, I think there's some interesting emerging data from uh, many countries, and I think US is uh, legalized in many states. Canada is doing that, and I think some other countries are also doing that. Uh, there is a huge body of evidence emerging that it has got a powerful role uh, in a complementary way. I don't think stories of just using uh, uh, cannabis oil, CBD oil, you know, uh, as a sole therapy uh, is going to work for everybody. I think there may be some that may, may do well with that, but I think um, the approach I take is that it is not about a monotherapy. It's not a, a you know, that you have a magic single uh, intervention that can help because the body is a very complex thing and the cancer is advanced as it is so many things have broken down in the body many things need to be fixed including nutrition and you know simple things like getting oxygen circulation etc so we work with the patients you know around this whole thing so some of this if available I would say yes I think these are you know these are things that can be used Dr. Ednin medical marijuana I think the evidence is out. Uh, I don't think there's enough compelling evidence to support it. Uh, there are some studies that are mixed in, in its nature. You need to be thinking of what is the outcome that you hope for. Um, and there's two different types of, of um, medicinal uh, marijuana. And yes, there's a couple of countries that are legalizing some aspects of it, but I don't think we've reached consensus on the evidence for it. There's still better alternatives at the moment. Last question. Uh -huh. I'm Dr. Desai from India, Bombay, practicing uh, preventive oncology for more than 18 years. I have got a few questions, plus some Just testimonials. Just one, sir. Yeah. We're running out of uh, time. Yeah. Uh, the evidence-based alternative medical science, uh, what are the evidences created, noted, or recorded? Uh, we have been treating these patients uh, for over a period of 20 years, and they have shown uh, 
good number of survivals, and these patients are dropped out from the Mayos and Tata Memorial in Bombay and big hospitals in Asia. So we believe this is not an alternative, but the main therapy and the alternative we also use is to some extent of the chemotherapy in a very minor metromanic doses only, not on the major therapy, and they show better survivals. And we have got a big list, maybe in hundreds of them surviving over a period of 10 and 12 years. The evidences which I have brought here to present to many places and departments. I would like to ask Dr. Subramanian as well as Adrian, what are the evidences created, noted, and been researched out of those so-called alternative theories which have been seen useful and practically uh, very uh, interesting thing? That should be the question for the uh, survival of these sciences and survival of cancer uh, disease patients. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to ask you, um, Dr. Vijay, to summarize. You've got five minutes, maybe taking into consideration what the gentleman just said, just asked you. Um, okay, thank you very much. I think uh, there's been very good questions, thought-provoking questions, and Dr. Hamza, as usual, has been economical with his truth. You know, he's got a huge blind spot of the failings of conventional treatment. He has, you know, put out some very visible <laughs> evidence of uh, failures of alternate treatment. And rightfully, we should be very aware of those dangers as well. So I share the sorrow of a patient like Azlin. That should never happen to any patient because these are conditions that are treatable. We should work as a team and we can cure those cancers. So I am with you, right on that page with you, Hamza. But beyond that, I think we need to overcome the blind spot. The blind spot is we are not doing very well with advanced cancers. The lady in the audience just now spoke about, we got very good 95% with early cancers. We are not debating that. That is no longer a debate. But we are doing very poorly about advanced cancers. And unfortunately, 75% or more of cancers present in advanced stages. What are we able to offer them? We are not yet able to offer that kind of cures. Like I wish every patient would stand up and say, look, I got treated and I am getting on with my life with full vigor. That is what we want. We are not there yet. The search is in the wrong places. We are looking at the wrong places for answers to solve this wider problem. So. I would turn to Dr. Hamza and I would say, and I'm sure you'll vote for this too, because at the end of the day, I'm not saying that my experience proves that every patient should jump into alternative therapy. It has opened my, my eyes to that there is huge potential for us to incorporate this as in a proper treatment protocols. Now, I'm not saying send this to the chicken seller to cure cancers. Now, that is a poor example, Hamza. I'm sure you can do better than that. You know? But those are the dangers. Like but those are the dangers that our patients face because our patients don't know which is the right chicken seller. So... <laughs> Stay above the belt, Dr. Vijay. Yes. Above. <laughs> so, my, my, my drive here is that doctors, because we are the primary caregivers in patients with cancer. We need to arm ourselves with the knowledge. We can be better guides and be able to support the journey of a cancer patient. We cannot continue to be in denial that, oh, these guys are doing funny stuff and okay, you know, we will not go there. No, that is not good enough. We need to be aware. And I can tell you, we didn't have time to discuss it. There are many, many therapies that are actually very effective. 10 seconds. Now, there can only be one winner in this debate. And it is not going to be Dr. Hamza. <laughs> and neither is it going to be me. The patients will have to emerge victorious. Their rights must be protected. Their voice must be heard. We, the doctors, are here to support you through this difficult journey with the burden of cancer. And you, the audience, has the power to give them the voice and the choice. 
vote wisely because you're voting for the new Malaysia. Oh, sorry, this was a wrong election. <laughs> you know. Thank you, no. Dr. Vijay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Edmund. I only went to an ophthalmologist uh, optician a few weeks ago and he said my eyesight was okay. So I'm not sure about your, your ability blind to spot, engage yeah. my own blind spot. Don't have that. I'll read a little poem. When I am in doubt, I talk to surgeons. I know they'll know what to do. They seem so sure. Once I talked to a surgeon, he said that when he is in doubt, he talks to priests. Priests will know what to do. Once I talked to a priest, he said that when he is in doubt, he talks to God. God will know what to do. God seems so sure. Once I talked to God, he said that when he is in doubt, he thinks of me. He says, I will know what to do. I seem so sure. Sometimes we seem so sure. We have a duty to care. We have a duty to explore the lives of our patients. It's not just cancer, it's diabetes, ischemic heart disease, multiple sclerosis, many ravages of disease will affect us, especially when we get older. We, have, we don't have a God-given right to live forever free of disease. There'll be something. If cancer doesn't kill us, something else will. But being in Malaysia, probably the Will be somebody driving a car without a seat belt or whatever else. Um, we have a duty because this debate is about doctors. We have taken an oath to duty of care. Yes, every day new things appear, and we deal with it rationally, as a as as a body um, that works together to recognize what will work, what will not work so that there is consensus um, to protect our patients and also to have in our own integrity within the profession that we choose to, to honour. And we need to do that. The quality of life of our patient depends our, on our integrity and honesty. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edmin. <laughs> Can I ask you to whip out your phone very quickly, go to the live polling the app, debate two, and vote again. Have you changed your mind? Think of the chickens. <laughs> you can only change one way. Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> the chicken's doing well. That was an underhanded tactic. <laughs> the chickens are not supposed to be debated here. 65-35, are we settling at that, Charles? Yes. Well done, Dr. Edmund. Okay. <laughs> With that, ladies and gentlemen, um, start this conversation, continue it, you know, outside. Um, rate the session in your feedback for future sessions. Do join us tomorrow for our third debate titled, The Time Has Come to Stop Investing in Chemo Preventive Trials. Thank you, our debaters, Dr. Vijay Subramaniam and Dr. Ednin Hamza. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.